Hello once again, and welcome to Taste and See on SSC Live TV. I'm Ken Jokes, and I'm here to accompany you on a wonderful journey to the intersection of faith and food. Today we're taking a look at a meal that is a, a particularly important meal in Christianity. As a matter of fact, it's the thing that draws us all together. Today on Taste and See, we're going to be examining the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. It's remarkable that the glue that holds us together is not that we all come to one particular place. The glue that holds us together is not that we all share a secret handshake of some sort. The thing that identifies us to the world, the thing that unites us together, is a common meal around a common table. And the scripture that I'd like to, to uh, take a look at this episode comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth to give them a little more instruction about how the Lord's Supper is to be administered. So hear this word of the Lord from verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke the bread, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Paul tells us some very important things in this passage. One of the things that really stands out for me is that this is an event that happened on the night of Jesus' betrayal. You know, so many times we understand that a person's last words tend to be their most significant. We can find the recordings of last words of famous people, and sometimes we turn to them for their wisdom and their insight. But here we have recorded the last actions of Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed. And Jesus did four things on that night. And the, the verbs are explicit. One of them is implied in this particular passage. The first thing that Jesus did was he took bread. So the first verb is took, right? He took bread and he gave thanks for it. There's, there's a lot of people in the world that will take the bread. That if you have bread on offer, they, they will take it. But Jesus, when he took the bread, he understood that taking and giving thanks for the bread are two actions that should always go together. So Jesus took bread and gave thanks for it, and then Jesus broke it. He, now, now the breaking, right, occurs only after thanks has been given. And then, having taken the bread, having given thanks for the bread, having broken the bread, then he gave the bread to his disciples. Now, those four essential actions, take, bless, break, and give, are interestingly the very same verbs, the very same actions that Jesus did when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. When he fed the 5,000, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, that is, he gave thanks for it, he broke the bread, 
and he gave it. And right there, right there, if we go no further, we have a beautiful template for the Christian life. How it is that we should be living as Christians from day to day. What's this day going to bring us? I don't know. What's tomorrow going to bring us? I have no clue. But I know that whatever it is, we need to receive it. We need to be able to have a spirit of receptivity. So what it is that we find from day to day, we'll take that. It may not be everything that we've ever dreamed of. It may not be, you know, all smiles and rainbows and, and everything. But we'll receive it. Because watch, we're going to take, we're, we're going to imitate Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, and we're going to imitate Jesus in the Lord's Supper. We're going to take what it is that we find. We're going to take the day. We're going to take the opportunity for our next breath. We're going to take it. We're not going to refuse it. We're not going to turn our back on it. We're not going to turn away from it. But we will receive what it is that comes our way. Somebody said, give us this day our daily bread. So we begin with a spirit of receptivity. But we receive it, watch this, not simply to leave it as it is. But we're going to receive the day. We're going to receive the opportunity. We're going to receive what it is that we encounter in order to bless it. So I'm going to take and I'm going to bless. Lord, bless this day. How many of us have cultivated the discipline of a little bit of prayer just to get our day started? I know a lot of times we'll pray around the dinner table. A lot of times we might kneel in prayer at the end of the day before we put our head down on the pillow. But there's a beautiful discipline in setting aside a portion of the morning, setting aside a portion of the early day to say, Lord, Bless the day that is in front of me. Bless the meetings that I'm going to have. Bless the relationships that I'm going to nurture. So I'm going to take, I'm going to bless, and then watch this. I'm going to break. I'm going to break something. Now, right, one of the reasons I'm not trusted around the kitchen a whole lot in the cleanup is because I seem to have slippery fingers. And so I might be washing the dishes and whoops, uh, one of them might break. That's not the kind of breaking we're talking about. We're talking about a little bit different kind of breaking. And that's like this. For us to be of greatest service to one another, we're going to have to break a little something off for somebody else every now and again. We're, we're not in this only for ourselves. But we need to be able to share, to, to break a portion of that which is given us so we can be of greater service to the whole. There's another way in which this breaking works. And it's like this. I want you to look around. What happens? God breaks the cloud to bring the rain. The rain comes down. A seed goes into the ground. It has to break open before it's going to yield the harvest. Things that are placed in the hands of our loving God may well be broken. And that includes hearts. It includes dreams. It includes looking at things a particular way and then discovering, oh my goodness, I can't look at it that way anymore. So there are things that we're going to take, we'll receive. We may bless them, and then there comes a breaking stage. God may break it. We may break it voluntarily. We may make a, a sacrifice is another way to say that. Take, bless, break, and then give. There's an interesting area of research that goes on, and it has captured my imagination. It's about a parallel economy that runs alongside the regular dollars and cents economy. It's called a gift economy. 
And if you have a little time left over sometime, go ahead and, you know, look it up on the internet, the gift economy. The gift economy works in a very, very different way than the financial economy. The financial economy is transactional. You give me this, I'll give you that. You give me a dollar, I'll give you, you know, a, a, a candy bar. So it's all transactional. The gift economy takes a longer view. The gift economy is based on celebration and community and unity and wholeness. So what we have in the Lord's Supper is a snapshot of a gift economy. God has given of God's self to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's thereby that we're empowered not only to give to one another, but we're empowered to give back to God. It's remarkable to me that these the, the Lord's Supper has that precursor in the feeding of the 5,000, which is a miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's interesting to me as well that it's at the close of that miracle in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 6, that Jesus makes a remarkably important point. He says this in John 6, verses 51 through 57. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now think of that for just a minute. Think of the living bread that Jesus is talking about. Do you remember in the Old Testament when God sustained the people of Israel out in the wilderness? How did he do it? He did it with bread from heaven, and that Moses called manna. Manna, which in the Hebrew means, what is it? Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, right there, Jesus is telling us about the sacrifice that's going to take place on Calvary. He's looking forward. He's looking ahead in time, saying that he will be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He will be sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. Verse 52, though, Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat. Now, just literally on the surface of it, it sounds like Jesus is recommending cannibalism. My goodness. Now, <laughs> I, I've got to tell you, um, I think those who are reacting in verse 52 are being willfully dense of the, the way Jesus is speaking here. They, they don't want to encounter what Jesus is saying about, you know, bread of heaven, which they would have objected to that idea as well, that eating of the bread of heaven and live forever. Well, you know, in, in Israel, they wandered in the desert and they died in the desert. And then Jesus' statement, this bread is my flesh. Well, that's, those are all pretty controversial statements. So there may well be an intentional, willful block on picking up on this idea and running with it. But watch, watch. This is Jesus' parabolic approach to a very, very difficult idea to understand. Jesus is making a point, a point about the substitutionary atonement. He is going to die on the cross that we might live. It's a very difficult thing to understand completely. And as Jesus is just walking by and encountering these people, and this is the way the conversation goes, Jesus throws out this very controversial statement. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, when Jesus gave a parable 
the parable had the action of sifting out the people who were genuinely curious and wanted the, the answer, wanted to learn more from the people who were just going to take it at surface value and let it go. So Jesus was able to separate the wheat from the chaff by that parabolic technique. And it seems to be working here because the Jews get fixated on this idea of we're supposed to be cannibals, which is not at all the point that Jesus is making. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. The one who feeds on me will live because of me. Now, I, I, I understand there, there are some out there who take all of this literally and understand in their understanding that the Lord's Supper is a literal uh, turning of the bread and the wine into the literal body and blood of Christ. So it's the doctrine of transubstantiation. I recognize this as emblematic speech and that what we have here are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ. Either way you take it, I'd like for you to understand there's some deep, deep things going on here. They're simple at one level, but they're central to our faith. Now, I've got bread and grape juice right here. How long can I stand here and look at the bread and the grape juice. I could stand here a good long time. I could probably stand here longer than you would care to watch me stand here, right? But the bread will not satisfy my hunger until I eat it. I have to partake of it for it to do me any good. Likewise, the cup. I have to, I have to drink of the cup in order to satisfy my thirst. If I just look at the cup, if I just look at the grape juice, it has no way that it can be of any benefit to me unless it's in me. It has to be in me to make a difference. Now, there are libraries full of books about Jesus. There are are encyclopedias that are writings about Jesus. But none of that, all of the libraries in the world filled with books about Jesus cannot save us. What we need is to have Christ dwelling within. And that's the basic figure behind the idea of partaking of the flesh of Jesus and partaking of the blood of Jesus. We as Jesus was incarnate, right? He came down from heaven and was born of woman. Just as Jesus was incarnate, so Jesus continues in a smaller way to be incarnate in the life of the believer. And so, as we gather around the table to partake of the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Christ what we are doing is reminding ourselves, not only, you know, Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. So we're bringing back together. We are remembering, right? That, that the members of the body of Christ return, come back together, enjoy this fellowship. You know, the richest symbols are those which can be understood on many different levels. A child can understand the Lord's Supper on one level, that God is God who's going to feed me. A, a more mature believer 
can understand the Lord's Supper on another level, the level of fellowship and communion, that we are united together by a particularly, uh, by, by a very powerful spiritual bond. Now, it's remarkable, it has always been remarkable to me that the symbols, the elements, are bread and the cup. Think of this. There is no loaf of bread, and I've used pita bread because it's, it's like the closest thing to what Jesus would have been using at that time. There's no bread that's made out of one single kernel of wheat. It just doesn't happen. It takes many, many, many kernels of wheat to make a loaf of bread, even a small, modest loaf like this one. It's not something that can be done alone. Likewise with the wine. One grape, if you squeeze one grape, you're not going to get the wine. It takes many grapes to come together and, right, as with the wheat kernels, they both need to be crushed. That If they're not crushed, somehow or another, they're not able to be brought together to make the, the bread or the wine. So many as we are, from so many different backgrounds, from so many different experiences, speaking different languages, coming from different places, as many as we are, we are one loaf in Jesus Christ coming from many different experiences and many different trials, tribulations, toils, and snares, many though they may be, we come together and we are one cup as we gather around the table of the Lord. I'm also reminded that Jesus' very first miracle was the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana of Galilee, and thereby... We've got wine once again as an emblem on a whole nother level. The wine that Jesus made in that first miracle is wine that is emblematic of joy. It's emblematic of a joy that only has its source in heaven. It only has its source in the imagination of God. So we've got joy. And what does bread do? Bread sustains us. The bread from heaven, the manna that came down from heaven, sustained the Israelites in the wilderness. For an entire generation, they were fed by manna. So once again, we've got the symbols of wine for joy and the symbols for, of, of bread for sustenance. We're able to be sustained in this life by the communion that we share with God, by, by the, the joy that we share as we come around the table. So communion reminds us that Christianity is a social faith. So many people want to take the, the Lone Ranger approach to Christianity. So many people want to say, well, I'm going to go it alone. I can go out by myself. I can pray by myself. I can, I can read the Bible by myself. Why do I need anybody else to be a Christian? Well, it's like this. We're made to be in relationship. Christianity is not checking the yes box to a list of propositional truths. No. Christianity is about a relationship that we share one with another and a relationship that we share with our Heavenly Father. So the hermits... Those who stay away, those who, who are secluded from the rest of the world, they're missing the opportunity to build the relationships that will allow them the spiritual exercise to thrive in heaven, the spiritual exercise of loving and looking out for one another. So communion, the Lord's Supper, means that which we share together that which identifies us under the common heading of being children of the king. And because we are all, likewise, children of the king, we have a seat at the table. You know what? If you 
don't have a seat at the table, we'd like to invite you to become a part of St. Stephen Church. Right here in Louisville, Kentucky, you may be watching from anywhere in the world, but our prayers are with you. And we have a place for you around the table here at St. Stephen Church. We have the ability to, to commune one with another. Many as we are, even though we may be separated by distance, we're united by the blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I would like to invite you to the table, invite you to the fellowship, invite you to the adventure of being a part of the body of Christ here at St. Stephen Church. So, as we read this scripture in 1 Corinthians, we recognize that the Lord's Supper is an invitation. As we read in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus is serious about the dimensions of his sacrifice for our benefit. The Lord's Supper has been called the Eucharist, which means the great thanksgiving. And it's good and it's right and it's fitting that we should lift up our hearts unto the Lord as we gather around his table. In the time of the Corinthians, the church at Corinth had what was called the love feast. And the love feast was a feast that to which everyone was invited they certainly had more than simply bread and the, the wine. They had all kinds of food. But as the food was brought in, it was shared among everyone present with a, a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of deliverance and hope, and a prayer of encouragement. Today, from St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky, I want to say thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of the Taste and See family. And we reach out to you to connect as part of the body of Christ at St. Stephen Church. Why don't you go ahead and contact the church at newstartsclive.org or give us a call. There'll be information down below about how you can connect with this wonderful fellowship. Until next time, this is Ken Jokes for Taste and See on SSC Live TV. Let somebody else know about us. And until next time, we'll see you then. Take good care. God bless you. Bye-bye.